Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thanks to HelloFresh for supporting our show. Go to HelloFresh.com slash AllInsane16 and use code AllInsane16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh is not only extremely convenient because it is delivered right to your door, but it is fresh and tasty. With summer being right around the corner, we all want a delicious lunch or dinner, and that is why I love HelloFresh because you have over 40 weekly recipes to choose from, and every single one of them tastes absolutely amazing. Enjoy today's episode. Hello. My name is Daisy, and I am going to be talking today about my experience with being autistic and ADHD. First of all, I wanted to ask you what you think of when autism comes up. Like, what what is your first reaction? That's a really good question, actually. Yeah. And to be completely honest, I can't even give you an actual answer because, like, I don't know. And well, you can give me literally anything. Like, okay, it, it, even the like because most I big, I will basic. Things. I will say that I feel like when it comes to anything especially autism, like at least I've heard from what I've heard, there's mm-hmm. a spectrum of it. Right. So, but I don't even know like what that be. I kind of think of it as somebody who's like very smart, but also maybe like doesn't have the same social skills. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, you know what I mean by that? Yeah, like yeah. it's, um, mm-hmm. how do you, how would you describe that, Julie? Like not socially awkward, but yeah. like I feel like there's a different like the brain is operating in a different way. Like I mm-hmm. almost feel like this is going to sound funny, but to compare it to myself, like I feel like Julie's going to get mad at me. I know I <laughs> I know I'm smart, but like I think that my smartness has like limits in a way. I think okay. I'm more like emotionally intelligent, and mm-hmm. I think I am really I have really good social skills and things like that. But when I think of somebody with autism, I think that they're kind of the opposite. Like they're like super smart but maybe that their social skills aren't as clear or maybe they're not as comfortable in social situations yeah that's how and I that is literally like I've never looked it up I really don't know but I guess if I really if somebody were to ask me that's what yeah my perception kind of has been Mm -hmm. but I've also never it's interesting because when I say like I heard that there's like a spectrum of it I've I don't think I've ever met someone like on the lower end, medium end, and higher end to really okay. compare, mm-hmm. you know? So that's... So you'd say you've never really had any exposure to have a real basis of what no. autism would look like in, no. a, in real life? Mm-mm. Yeah, that that seems to be a lot of people's experiences yeah. where they go through life and they never interact with a disabled person ever. Right. Or if they've had an interaction, it's not been very good mm-hmm. or they don't think highly of disabled people because... Right even the word disabled, like it's so othering from yeah. them. Um, but you you ha- you touched on some things that we're definitely gonna, gonna talk about. Okay. Um, so for the, the way that autism is classified is a neurodevelopmental disorder. I don't like using the word disorder, mm-hmm. but um, that's neither here nor there. So it mainly impacts interactions with others, communication, learning, and behavior. Um, so it could look something like like a smart person who just doesn't really understand social cues very mm-hmm. well. Um, it could also look like somebody who really can't handle a lot of sensory input and cannot speak because of that stress that goes on in their lives. Okay. Um, so what you were talking about with like the low, medium, and high ends, mm-hmm. um, lots of people, because of older studies that have been done, um, think of that in the high functioning and low functioning ends. Uh, we don't use functioning labels anymore mm-hmm. because it is very minimizing to right. the abilities of those of all autistic people, regardless of their experiences. Mm-hmm. So. We, instead of saying functioning, like I to to a neurotypical person would look like a high functioning autistic or what used to be known as Asperger's. Mm -hmm. Uh, You might have heard of that before. Um, We also don't use Asperger's as a label because that um, Asperger's as a syndrome was developed or was named after a Nazi Mm -hmm. Um, so a doctor who worked with the Nazi party in Germany would find autistic people and categorize them 
okay. with the the ones that they did not want and the ones that they did want, which were the Aspergers. So the higher the higher functioning people okay. were the ones that they didn't kill. So that's why we don't use Aspergers anymore. Um, so instead, we choose to use needs labels. Okay. So I have lower needs in the sense that I need less support to be a independent individual. Mm-hmm. Whereas somebody who is nonverbal, who doesn't, who it doesn't have the ability to speak consistently in their life, mm-hmm. would be on the lower needs, right, or on the higher needs end. Excuse me. Um, so that's kind of the the beginning yeah. of what you might know about autism. When it gets a little bit more in depth is when you start to dive into the experience of autistic living, Mm -hmm. of what being neurodivergent looks like in real life. Um, And the way that it works is that it is a uh, a genetic thing. You start to develop symptoms around the age of two to three, depending on the child. Some have more obvious symptoms, some have yeah. less obvious symptoms. Because they say some uh, an example of a symptom could be like lack of eye contact, Lack right? of eye contact, okay. yeah. That's a very popular, stereotypical mm-hmm. um, autism indicator. Yeah, uh, but not always the case. It is not always the case. Okay. Uh, like, for example, right now I'm making eye contact with right. you, and um, that's another thing that we'll get into. Okay. The – another – a lot of uh, people look for the very obvious symptoms in yeah. children because the way that autism has been researched has been for young boys specifically. So the way that it looks like in young boys is going to look a lot different than the way that it looks in young girls, which hasn't been researched nearly as much. So you might think of a really stone cold little kid who doesn't empathize with other people, who doesn't talk, who might throw a tantrum if the lights are too bright Mm -hmm. um so the avoiding eye contact uh the lack of play or not playing like a normal normal neurotypical Mm -hmm. kid would um you might see the uh lining up of toys like from biggest to smallest in like a perfect little row yeah um i used to do that a lot Mm -hmm. (laughs) but because i as a female presenting person, the way that it, the, both the way that autism impacts me and the way that I was socialized growing up has an impact on how obvious autism looks like in the difference in boys and girls. Right. So for me, my, like I would make eye contact and I was sociable because I was trained to be that way. Mm-hmm. I was trained to value relationships, to think that interacting with other people is really important. So that way, my ability or my masking, the way that I pretended to fit in, to interact with others, was seamless enough right. that it wasn't caught. Um, I think this is also partially because my mom um, works with special needs kids. So she didn't see the obvious things. Like she was trained to see the obvious and I wasn't obvious. So I got overlooked in that capacity. Okay. Um, So it's it's very complicated. Um, Some uh, of the things that I experience on a day-to-day basis that um, I actually made a list Mm-hmm. For my therapist, really? <laughs> I made a really long list uh-huh. to prove that I had something going on with me. Um, and these are just some of the things from that Wait, list. So to kind of go back to that. So did your therapist did not diagnose you with autism? Like OK, so um, the first therapist I had, mm-hmm. uh, I had just come from my background of not having ever gone to therapy until I was 18, 19. And then um, I had uh, just assumed that I was just depressed and anxious okay. my entire life. And that was it. And that was what was wrong with me. Um, I had that confirmed by my primary care doctor. They gave me a, a cute little assessment and said, yeah. oh, you're depressed and you have anxiety. That's okay. Mm-hmm. We can give you medicine for it. Mm-hmm. I didn't like the medicine because it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 
when I went to my first therapist, she was a therapist who worked with uh, children mm -hmm. and a lot of autistic children as, at, as well. So when I had had the inkling that something might be a little bit neurodiverse about me, she said, there's no way. There's no possible way. Like you maintain eye contact with me. You hold conversations really well. You're yeah. very sociable. You're friendly. You're empathetic. None of those things are autistic, which is not true. Yeah. <laughs> um, she just seemed to have uh, a very shallow concept mm -hmm. of what autism can look like in and adults. And like you said too, kind of just looking at the stereotypical normal, yes. I guess you could say, mm -hmm. symptoms or signs. Well, I think from her perspective, obviously I don't know because I'm not her, yeah. but because my autism wasn't impacting her, it wasn't enough that yeah. made her uncomfortable she didn't think that there could have been anything right that would have been going on with me like with her other clients perhaps mm -hmm. that were had more obvious symptoms that had higher needs those ones are like oh yeah obviously that kid is uh, is autistic right um you just weren't you weren't obvious i just wasn't yeah. obvious yeah because i had spent 20 now 22 years of my life hello, training myself to, to blend in, mm -hmm. to look like the perfect neurotypical person right. to the best of my ability. Now, that didn't save me from anything. Mm -hmm. um, I still was bullied. I was still the weird kid. I was still outed or ousted mm -hmm. from my peer group because I was different and they could tell, but I didn't know what was, what was right. wrong, what was different about me. And it wasn't obvious to me, it wasn't obvious to them, except the fact that I just behaved a little bit differently. I wasn't blending in quite as well as right. they would have wanted me to. Um, so I was I was punished for my imperfect ability to blend in, um, which really is terrible. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But some things that uh, autistic people experience not all of not all I'm obviously not speaking for all autistic people or all ADHD people um but there are, here are some words that you could use to okay. describe some of these things and I will also preface by saying that autistic ADHD neurodiverse behaviors are in fact just human behaviors right it is the volume frequency and impact that it has on your life which does make a difference okay. in whether or not you do or don't have autism, ADHD, right. other neurodiversity. So is this the list that you made? This is part of the list okay. that I made. Got I have it. I have a list. I okay. I had the names and I had mm -hmm. all the examples. Some of them had like lots of examples. Mm -hmm. um, but starting with a few important ones, uh, echolalia. Do you know what that means? No. So echolalia can refer to one's need to repeat sounds, phrases, or words, or scripts, you know what scripts means, mm -hmm. um, to just blurt things out. Like, for example, um, I if someone said something that reminded me of a, a, a line from SpongeBob, mm -hmm. I would just blurt it out immediately. Okay. Um, or if... A, like one word from a song came up, I would start singing the song. Um, sometimes it's just random words that pop into my head that, oh, this would feel good to say right now. And it just comes out of my face. So it's one, one thing about autism versus ADHD. Autism is more of like a, a self-soothing necessity. Like there's a lot of things that autistic people do specifically to relieve some of the sensory anxiety that is brought up by existing. Mm -hmm. um, ADHD is, has similar, a lot of similar sensory issues, but the way that it's dealt with is a little bit different. Okay. Um, the There's a lot more impulsivity in ADHD, whereas autism is more like you need a routine right. to be consistent. So I, I do have a question. Yeah. So the word, what's the word that you just said again? Echolalia. Okay. So how you said it's like this, this urge to like blurt out words. 
obviously Tourette's is way more I guess intensified version Mm -hmm. of that in a way because it's it's similar right it would be like a similar kind of thing I was gonna talk about this actually so there's there's a few words that Uh. can be used with both Tourette's and autism okay um so you might have heard of coprolalia which is uh it's more common in uh Tourette's Mm -hmm. where it is the the blurting out of inappropriate phrases or words okay echolalia is just copying things Okay. Um, but they're simply like they're, fall they're, under. They're very similar okay. in the way that they're presented outwardly, but the way that they're processed in the brain is it's very different. different. Okay. Yes. Got it. Um, same thing with ticks. Mm-hmm. With Tourette's, the the echolalia, coprolalia, ticks, they're involuntary. The right. the brain has synapses going that shouldn't be firing in those moments because right. you don't really have control over what you don't have control okay. when you have Tourette's um so those things just happen to you through you through your brain right. whereas with autism echolalia uh tics I'm not sure if coprolalia is a part of it most mm-hmm. likely it is since echolalia is a very um entwined part of coprolalia yeah. as well but um the way that it functions in autism is more for self-soothing mm-hmm. like the person does have control over when it can come out okay for the most part for people with lower fun lower needs it might they might have more ability to okay. control that whereas someone with higher needs might not have as much ability to control Got that it. Okay. um it just kind of depends on the person there's i like to instead of thinking of it as a the light spectrum, you know, there's the the rainbow, and um, it goes one it goes one dimensional. I like to think of it as like a color wheel instead, mm-hmm. where there is it's almost three dimensional in how every person with autism, every person with ADHD, every neurodiverse person is so very different from another neurodiverse mm-hmm. person. The way that it impacts them, the way that they present themselves to the world. All of it is just so different from person to person. So right. this is just my experience. And yeah. my experience might be very similar to someone else's experience, but I can never talk for someone else. Yeah. Um, That's why are, I like that it's like everything you're explaining is like very educational too. Yeah. Because it gives a really good perspective. Right. On everything as a whole rather yeah. than just... Because it's good to it's good to know too, like how you personally experience things. Mm-hmm. But I think also it's good to educate people. Because even like me, for example, like I didn't know, you yeah. know. There, and I think that it goes so much deeper than just the term autism as well, exactly. which is really interesting. Yeah, and the the way that I realized that something was different was by talking to yeah. people who had ADHD and autism, right. who had their experiences drawn out for them. I have one more question. Go ahead. I don't want to forget. It's okay. So, because I noticed you keep referring to ADHD and autism together. So yes. do those usually come hand in hand or sometimes it can, I mean, I know some people can just have ADHD, yes. but with autism, is it usually both or can you just have autism as well? So that's that's one of those fun things that yeah. we don't really know a whole awful lot about. Okay. Um, there are... ADHD is the most common childhood diagnosed disorder. Um, It is like something that people just throw that diagnosis on a lot of kids. Um, And shit, I got diagnosed with it last year and I was like, I don't know about that, but yeah, yeah it's, I, I, I it's, just, it's a very, it's a very easy thing to just yes. throw on someone. And yes, that person very well could be ADHD. Right. It could be that that is impacting them in such yeah. a way, but it's, it's kind of a cop out in a lot of ways. Right. And I, I don't think too, I think a lot of people when they things. seek out therapy or help is because they want help. They don't want yeah, just a diagnosis exactly. and to slap some medicine on it. Mm-hmm. Like, so yeah. Yeah. My therapist actually was more cautious about diagnosing me with certain right. things. Uh, she wanted to hear my reason for why I wanted a diagnosis before she just went ahead and did yeah. the tests. Um, and she validated that me getting a diagnosis would be very validating for my mm-hmm. existence for how I can interact with the world and to have a name for what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Um, well, I think too, because like you said, you knew growing up, you felt different and something felt was different, different, but you didn't know what it was. I think that yeah. is in a way 
that was something that could help you kind Mm -hmm. of close that curiosity of, okay, so what's going on? Yeah. I think there's also just a lack of like, I guess noticing what the experience of experiences of children and teens yeah. are like a lot of adults will sort of just brush off mm-hmm. what children are talking about. Oh, they just really care about this topic. They they're not obsessed with it. That's not a special interest. They just really like talking about it. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, or oh, you're just being dramatic. You're you're not actually stressed out by the fact that you can see the lights flashing. Mm-hmm. Like you're not stressed out by the fact that there's a car running, car driving by. It's it's very dismissive of the way that children express themselves, which is really frustrating and has led to me being undiagnosed for more than 20 yeah. years of my life because nobody believed me when I told them that there was something wrong right. or when I expressed that the things that my peers were doing to me was not okay. Like, I remember the first time I felt specifically othered by um, my peers was when I was six. I was in kindergarten and I was just trying to play with my friend for a couple minutes before we had to sit down for a little like little group circle to talk about the days of the week or whatever and one of the kids looked at me and said stop doing that you're so weird and just like walked away and I was like I don't I couldn't understand I couldn't fathom why that would be coming out of a six-year-old yeah much less what I was doing (laughs) that was so offensive to Mm -hmm. them who also is a kid that's going to hurt your feelings naturally. And it's, right. those kind of things stick with you. Hi. Hello. You're moving my microphone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> she is adorable. She is the star. Of the show. <laughs> she is the star. It's so funny. I had somebody tell me that they listened to the show, but they didn't watch it. <laughs> and that they heard me talking about the cats. And then yes. as I was on FaceTime, the cats were walking by and they were like, okay, I guess that's the cat that's that the you cats. talk about. Yes. That's, that's actually the exact <laughs> one that always makes the appearance. She mm-hmm. loves the camera. Okay, sorry. Keep no, going. No, yeah, it's okay. No, but I, yeah, I was just saying as a, as a kid that, you know, stuff like that sticks with you and it, it hurt. Yeah. I mean, we're sensitive when we're young. So, mm-hmm. so things like that are going to hurt our feelings and right. really make us think, is something wrong with me? Exactly. Yeah. And that was a running theme throughout mm-hmm. my childhood that there was, I was trying so hard to do all of the right things to, to like fit in, fit in yeah. to be like my peers, but I just couldn't quite make it work. Mm-hmm. And that's because I'm not like my peers. Right. I'm not neurotypical. I'm, I'm different and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And that should have been okay, but it wasn't. Right. It wasn't to them. And that meant everything to me because of the way I was socialized, the way that I was taught to value other people's opinions of me, to value friendships, to value relationships, Mm -hmm. even more so than I valued my own opinion or my own comfort in a situation. Um, The way that I was brought up and a lot of undiagnosed autistic ADHD people, as they grow up, they're taught how to fit how to fit the little cookie cutter of what society wants from you, Mm -hmm. how to have a conversation, how to not be weird. (laughs) That the main thing that people called me weird, weird, weird. You're so weird. Mm -hmm. I know I'm weird because I'm not like you, but you shouldn't say weird to mean something worse to to put me down. Right. Like I can be weird because I'm just different. But weird has such a negative connotation. Maybe pick another word. Mm -hmm. Like the way that I do that is not the same way that you do that. Right. And that's okay. Um, Now, that is to say that nothing I should do should be passed off by the fact that I'm autistic, that I'm ADHD. I can't just say whatever I'm thinking to someone and it hurts their feelings, and they tell me that it hurts their feelings, and I say, oh, I'm autistic. Didn't mean it. Right. Doesn't matter. That's not true. My words have just as much impact on someone who's neurotypical as a neurotypical person's words have on me. So it doesn't 
denounce what I do or what I say. Yeah. But it does create a foundation for misunderstanding between me and the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the way my brain functions is so different from the way that the majority, the neurotypical, abled, cisgender, white man Mm -hmm. is the way that I function is so different from the way that they function. So me trying to put myself into that is really damaging. Yeah. And it doing that causes your identity to kind of just disappear. Like with masking, um, masking is the term that autistic people use to refer to how they have to pretend, how they have to behave to cover up what their natural way of being is to blend in with society. Mm -hmm. And everyone does it there if if you don't do it now then you have in the past everyone to some degree has put on a mask to go out and be in society in an appropriate manner that doesn't hurt other people's feelings um to sort of cater to the social game that you have to play Mm -hmm. but the difference between a neurotypical masking and an autistic person masking is the, the way that masking occurs. So for a neurotypical person, you might say, for example, if you meet someone for the first time, oh, hi, how are you? My name's so-and-so. And they would respond with the appropriate way to respond, the, like, nice to meet you too. My name is so-and-so. That's the right way to respond, right? That's That would be considered masking, but... A neurodivergent person, an autistic person, an ADHD person, would be thinking about how long they've been making eye contact. They think about how their face moves. They intentionally curate the situation, their, the way that their body is presenting, in order to cater to the neurotypical person. So... Even now, as I'm having this conversation with you, I'm having, I am counting how long I'm looking at your, into your eyes, an eye contact thing. I count and then I look away and then I think about how long I've been looking away and then I come back to eye contact and then sometimes it goes a little too long and then I look away again. Mm-hmm. It's this, this innate thing that happens for neurotypical people that doesn't happen for me. Right. If I had it's the not option, it's natural to just like it, have it happen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't just come to me. I have to right. think about those things. If I had the option, I would only look at your lips mm-hmm. because I have what's called audio processing disorder, which impacts my ability to understand speech. Um, so, if you said something that I didn't understand, I would look at your face to catch it on your lips. But that's all, that's what the choice of looking at your face that I would give yeah. for the most part, unless I was analyzing your face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so it's a very interesting dance that you have to portray to the world to fit in, to have interactions that feel safe yeah because that's a huge part of masking is safety because you don't know your audience you if you meet someone for the first time you don't know them Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's no way to know how they're going to react to you so putting on the the pretty little neurotypical mask prevents something dangerous from happening potentially because a lot of times even After the mask has come off and you feel comfortable with somebody, they might take advantage of you as a neurodivergent person because of the way that autism works in the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, I and a lot of other other autistic people are very gullible. The, uh, The way that English works is very figurative. So there is often times where something in the language itself isn't very direct and it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So if someone's trying to play a trick on me, I wouldn't know that immediately unless right. I had experienced it before. So 
that can be a very dangerous situation if I'm coming to someone for the first time and I'm just totally myself, mask off, they can take advantage of me really easily, which is not something that I want. No. So that's that's one potential benefit of masking is just for the sake of introductions, for safety yeah. in knowing the the person that you're doing this social dance with. Yeah. Um, beyond that, masking is really harmful because it can impact your sense of identity. You don't know who you are without the mask. You put on this persona of, oh, I'm a nice person. I speak very calmly. I am not very blunt. I try to word things in such a way that are pleasing and appealing mm -hmm. to the neurotypical audience. But that's not who I am inside. That's not who I have been. Right. I am naturally a very blunt person. That's a lot of autistic people's experience. I, I like direct communication. Um, I like knowing what's going on. <laughs> Hello, kitty. <laughs> I like it when other people speak directly to me. I yeah. like very clear, concise knowledge about what I'm being communicated. Hello. You're you're moving you're moving the mic you're she, moving the microphone. She's <laughs> enough. And now for a quick commercial break and a word from our sponsor. Who doesn't want a delicious, tasty meal that can be made quick but is also fresh and you have all the ingredients you need pre-portioned right in front of you? HelloFresh does more than just make delicious dinners. With over 40 weekly recipes to choose from, whether you are vegetarian, you love meat, you're pescatarian, HelloFresh has something for you. Delivered right to your front door on the day that you choose, HelloFresh can make meals for just you and you might have another day of leftovers or for the whole family. One of my favorite things is their new fast and fresh options, which are ready in just 15 minutes. I do not like taking a long time to cook because I know that afterwards I'm going to have to clean the dishes. So being able to cook and have dinner ready in just 15 minutes is a lifesaver and game changer. Not only does HelloFresh come out to be cheaper than grocery shopping, you also don't waste any ingredients. Something that I cannot stand is going to the grocery store and getting way too much than I actually need, which I feel like all of us are guilty of, and then having to waste food or the food goes bad and that is something great because now you're not going to waste any ingredients and you always use only what you need because everything is pre-portioned out in the meals. Go to HelloFresh.com slash AllInsane and use code AllInsane for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash AllInsane and use code AllInsane for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Now back to the episode. The way that neurotypicals mask is very infrequent. It's the way that society, like social interactions come to them is much more natural. Yeah. But as an autistic or ADHD person, masking is very intentional and is exhausting. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy to pretend. Like for actors, if you're acting for 8, 10, 12 hours in a day, that's tiring. You're doing a lot of work pretending to be someone else. It's the exact same way for autistic people, but they're just going about their lives. Right. They're just going to work and they have to put on this front in order to be safe, in order to go about life without being punched in the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because there have been times where I have just said something because someone asked me something and I tell them the direct answer and they get mad at me for telling them what I observe what my what I see as the truth is in that situation and it hasn't gone well um which I think is terribly ridiculous yeah why should I have to soften myself for your sake for someone else's sensitive. sake exactly yeah. yeah and the funny thing is that I am the definition of sensitive like there is something that a lot of autistic and neurodivergent people deal with is called RSD, reje rejection sensitive dysphoria, um, which is the, the fancy way to say if any if 
any at all or even perceived rejection happens in any situation, you immediately feel crushed. Yeah. Like you feel like they hate you now, (laughs) Um, which might not be true at all. They might not even be rejecting you or they might not even, they might be inviting you to do something. Yeah. I feel like to it, like it kind of seems like like the fear of like disapproval and exactly yeah like yeah mm-hmm. um i don't know if that's a genetic part of in- autism or adhd but i know that it impacts me yeah <laughs> every single day like for example something that is a combination of a few things not understanding social cues the rejection sensitivity dysphoria is when somebody say hey we're getting lunch I take that as, oh, you guys are getting lunch and you haven't invited me yet. But we're getting lunch is they're they're saying where I'm inviting you to come with us to go to lunch. Mm -hmm. But they didn't say that. So I misinterpret that as, oh, I guess you're just telling me about your plans and I'm not invited and that's okay, I guess. But I'm hurt because you're not inviting me. So the... The way that that's resolved is, hey, we're getting lunch. I want you to come with me. Yeah. Because that's clear. That's direct. These are the plans. I I explicitly want your presence Mm -hmm. in this this interaction. Um, But apparently that's just something that people know. They, you say, hey, we're getting lunch, and people just know mm-hmm. that that's an invitation. But that was never something that was obvious to me. Yeah, uh, I had to be taught that. I had to study that. I right. spent years studying human behavior. I did a lot of research just to tweak my mask a little bit more to fit what was being expected of me at the time. And currently, I still use a lot of those techniques that I learned from the research that I did so it's just a lot of training yourself to be something that you're not which is really not good for you Mm -hmm. it's not good to pretend to be something that you're not um it's not good for your mental health it's not good for other people there have been times where I have the mask on and then it just drops and the person that I'm talking to notices a shift in the dynamic of our relationship and that sometimes has been friendship ending relationship ending where i am so different from where i started in our relationship that the change is too much for them yeah they don't know how to be friends they don't know how to be friends with yeah. me yeah. yeah because i was putting on this front that i was more independent that i was less sensitive less needy whatever negative thing that they might say about it so there have been a lot of times where i think that it's okay to be myself around them but it's actually not um because i think in part i had never tried being myself around them before that but it was too late yeah so it's very frustrating in -hmm. that capacity um I think that was also a contributing factor as to why I never got diagnosed, why it wasn't noticed in me earlier. I think one of the main factors as to why I particularly went unnoticed is, well, first and foremost, that I am a a le- less a lower needs person. Mm-hmm. I don't need a lot of support in order to function. Right. Um, But also because the ratio of boys who are diagnosed is four times that of the the amount of girls that are diagnosed. Wow. Yes. So in 2020, the ratio of diagnosed children to um, neurotypical children is 1 in 36. And from those 1 in 36, four times more diagnosed below the age of eight were boys than girls Mm -hmm. um now it used to be less i believe in 2000 it was one in 26 children who were diagnosed with autism but they attribute it to better screenings things like that Mm -hmm. um and it was 2020 was the first time that the 
percentage of girls aged eight was above one percent mm-hmm. <laughs> who were diagnosed with autism, which is awesome. Yeah. We love that mm-hmm. girls are being noticed in their yeah. in their struggles right. sooner. But that's still a really small percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, I again think that's just a lack of research. Right, they haven't looked into it enough uh, because there is. Like, they're not expanding the research past what they've known. Exactly. Yes. If they are, it hasn't come out yet, and it's yeah. not widely spread. Um, so it impacts the the way that girls grow up. Mm-hmm. It impacts the way that boys grow up. Um, one thing that I noticed about the difference between autistic boys and autistic girls, even the ones who had been diagnosed later in life, is the... The socialization of of both or either feels like it's heightened a little bit. Um, for example, the way that masking works for for both of them, um, the having to put on pretty words in order to appease people for girls is much higher. In autistic girls that might be mm-hmm. why it's a little bit different for them like why they're noticed as being weird like yeah. oh you speak like why are you using such big words because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that was that was trained in me to to speak above yeah. what uh even my peers were which is very like ableistic and linguistic superior superiority complex which Mm -hmm. is a whole nother topic but on this in the same but opposite way there is a lot of entitlement in autistic boys and men they they take that socialization of because i'm a man because i'm autistic i should get these things and it's even worse in autistic boys than it is in in neurotypical boys and neurotypical men and autistic men it's it is wild Mm -hmm. that's been my experience okay i don't know if this is true of all autistic men and boys but the ones that i have interacted with have been so terribly entitled Mm -hmm. that it i it is intolerable to interact with them even as someone who understands them on a fundamental level Mm -hmm. their experience is fundamentally very similar to mine but socially so different yeah. that it's impossible to interact with them there's just no empathy and the entitlement is beyond acceptable much less tolerable mm-hmm. so i think that's also one of those things that those who are more low needs tend to fit that, oh, you're such a perfect little neurotypical person that there's no way that you could be autistic. Um, I speak very clearly. I can communicate how I'm feeling. I can communicate when I need something. So I just got swept under the rug in that way. Um, The the socialization is really a huge huge thing that they haven't really looked into on Mm -hmm. girls because in young girls they tend to play more than autistic boys one of the very stereotypical symptoms would be that they don't play that autistic kids don't play that Mm -hmm. way they don't play with other kids they don't interact they don't show you things they don't present something that they made to you autistic little girls do Because they're socialized that way. And it might also be that they're genetically impacted differently. Right. So it changes the way that they are perceived by their parents. They are perceived by adults. Like, all throughout school, I was a pleasure to have in class. Because I would sit there and be perfect. And then I'd go home and melt down if I didn't have a snack. Yeah. (laughs) An hour before dinner which my mom thought would ruin my appetite, but I just was hangry Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it had been too many hours since lunchtime. It coupled with all of the stress of going to school on top of being autistic, 
I would just have problems. Mm -hmm. There would just be more problems. I would lash out at my parents. There would be meltdowns, crying, just because the one thing that I needed in the afternoon wasn't being given to me or my schedule changed. Right. Like, oh, we have to go to the doctor's office right after school so you can't have your snack. Ooh, that would be a problem. (laughs) Um, And even to this day, stuff like that happens where I am going about my day and, oh, the ADHD, time blindness has befallen me and now I'm late and now I'm crying on the way because I'm late Mm -hmm. and my plans were ruined because I'm late (laughs) yeah and I haven't even gotten there yet it's the beginning of the day and I'm late and I'm crying already so it I think because of that the the threshold for stress is so much like lower for autistic and ADHD people because they have to deal with so many more executive functioning Mm -hmm. issues. Do you know what executive functioning is? Mm -mm. So executive functioning refers to starting and completing tasks. Um, So your ability to function in executing things. Um, So because there is executive functioning issues for both autism and ADHD, literally everything that is started and has to be finished requires more energy yeah if you have and like if that gets messed up in any way then it's like mm -hmm. a meltdown yes okay or you just run out yeah you just run out um something that the disability community coined the spoon theory i like to use for autism as well i mean i am disabled because i'm autistic but um it applies for adhd as well um if you have 12 spoons for the day and getting up requires one spoon. You've used your spoon. You can't have that spoon anymore. You have 11 spoons. Brushing your teeth requires two spoons because it is such a terrible sensory experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you've used those spoons. You have nine spoons. Making breakfast, three spoons. <laughs> you keep going. You keep going. You have one spoon left to do all of the activities for the rest of the day. Right before you've even gotten out the door. Mm -hmm. So that's, I believe, the main reason why a lot of autistic people don't have jobs. There is, I I forget which year the survey was taken, only 30% of autistic people have jobs, full-time jobs. At least 60% of autistic people are entirely unemployed. So... That's a a whole 80% of autistic people who just are in limbo about where their standing is in life. Now, there are some higher needs autistic people who will have care for the rest of their lives because of their needs. But there's a lot of low needs autistic people who just kind of have to figure it out in a world that's not meant for them. So I have a full-time job. I work as an American Sign Language interpreter. But I have been burnt out for the last year and a half. So just existing, masking constantly causes burnout. Mm -hmm. And I haven't even begun my job yet. So that's the trade-off. You have a job, you're burnt out constantly. You don't have a job, you can't live. Yeah. It's really a uh, an unfair world that Mm -hmm. autistic people have to deal with. Because is it worth being burnt out constantly to have a job? Mm -hmm. Well, is it worth your mental health to not have a job? You know? Yeah. Why should we have to make that decision? Why should that have to be a question at all? Yeah. That's really frustrating. For sure. I'm I'm privileged in that way. I'm low needs. Mm-hmm. I'm functional enough that I can go to work. I can maintain a job. I haven't accidentally offended my boss to the point where they fired me. I haven't just walked out from the job because it was too much. That's very well something that could happen to me. Mm-hmm. I would ideally like that to not happen, but... 
I'm privileged in that way yeah. where I can maintain a job at my own expense. So that was one of the things that made me notice that something was different, that I was just constantly in a state of exhaustion, that something was different about the way my brain worked. Um, this came about in part just from the way that I felt about myself, about the world, but also because of talking to other people, mm -hmm. talking to neurotypical people who weren't experiencing burnout and how their life seemed so perfect it's and more simple. happy yeah. and neat. Like they mm -hmm. can maintain their houses. They don't have to worry about tripping over something on accident. Yeah, it's like your brain, it's like constantly the wheels are like spinning. Yes, my brain does not turn off. Right. And I, I don't have any medication. I'm trying to get some, but of course there's a national yeah, that shortage was gonna, right now. <laughs> that was going to be m one of my questions for you. If mm -hmm. there is medication. For autism? Yeah. No. Okay. If you... It's just not, something not they need to for, deal with. Not for l like lower needs autism. Okay. Um, for higher needs autism, you can take something like a mood stabilizer, which okay. would be more for uh, like bipolar mm -hmm. or for something along those lines. You right. can... There can be medic medications that you can take, but there's not something for autism right. that lessens the sensory experience because mm -hmm. that's really what it boils down to. And My sensory no experience is so intense. Yeah. And there's no understanding of why there is lower and higher needs no. people, right? It just um, depends. From, from what I've seen, uh, there has been research that – came out recently that studied the neural pathways in the differences between neurodivergent populations and neurotypical populations. Mm -hmm. They discovered that neurodivergent people, when they're growing up, when they're developing, their neural pathways are trimmed by okay. about 30%. Mm -hmm. Neurotypical neural pathways are trimmed by half. There's about 50% okay. of the connections that were made as a baby that were trimmed mm -hmm. throughout childhood. So there are more synaptic pathways in the brain, which they, they attribute to having more synaptic pathways to having disabilities, yeah. uh, specifically cognitive disabilities. They have no idea why. Okay. They just know that the more you have the more problems you have. That's just like so crazy to it's, me that like yeah. it, there is such a wide spectrum of that. Mm -hmm. That's crazy too. It is yeah. very crazy. And yeah. even in general, I feel like um, there's people too who I feel like can, like we were kind of saying before, you can have just autism or you can have autism and then another five things along with it. So yes. it's just so interesting Yeah, how that can just happen mm -hmm. literally. And we don't know why. Yeah. there's There's not really been enough research it's it has been proven that people who have more cognitive disabilities have more neural pathways but they don't know why that impacts yeah. people so heavily um i feel from from my perspective my untrained uneducated perspective uh feel like it's because the more your brain has to process mm -hmm. the longer it takes to process everything right so when I was getting my diagnosis, mm -hmm. I took a, um, a processing speed test where I had to find the symbol and among a group of symbols had to indicate which symbol matched or if there was no matching symbol mm -hmm. from the options. Um, and another one that I took where... I there was numbers and symbols associated with the numbers and I had to draw the symbols next to the numbers. Yeah. Um I had my score for for those tests was like way higher than average. Yeah. <laughs> way higher than what a neurotypical's processing speed would mm -hmm. be. Um so because of that that makes me think that the, the quote-unquote impairment comes from 
the fact that there is so much information coming into my brain. I have to filter out all of that information in order to make sense of what the world is around me. Yeah. Um, so you in the beginning, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. You said autism is genetic? Yes. Okay. So this is a very controversial question. Feel free. Ask, but because I've heard that or people sometimes have been making assumptions mm-hmm. that autism can come from vaccinations. Vaccines. Yes. yes. That is not true okay. at all. I wanted your opinion on that. Yes. There is no scientific evidence. Mm-hmm. Um the person who made that research and spread it across the country, mm-hmm. that that research was proved to be false and that researcher was removed of his doctorate license. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's totally falsified yeah. information. Um, and it has been used for years right. to fear monger with vaccinations. Mm-hmm. Please, please, please vaccinate your kids. Yeah. Please vaccinate and, your kids. And I think too, there's there's definitely, just like with animals, there are definitely vaccinations that I think mm-hmm. that babies, animals, they need. Because yes. if they don't get them, I mean, I've literally seen, I don't know which one it is for dogs, but like mm-hmm. I've seen many studies of dogs that didn't get, I think it's maybe distemper. Mm-hmm. And like genuinely, like their faces change, their brains don't develop. It's a whole thing. Yeah. But I do think too, just like in animals and kids if you don't do it correctly or you mm-hmm. do too much at once like that can have negative negative effects too yes um but, so i do think that there's good and bad with everything but right. you know i but vaccinations don't yeah. have any impact on autism right it it does it is it is genetic mm-hmm. it is something that you're born with and the with the developmental process it the symptoms start to show but your baby is born with autism like you, okay. you can't there's no curing it there's no giving it to the kid mm-hmm. um it's just not so scientific. there's no kids that have autism that like oh i guess down their genetic line someone didn't have it as well um it's hard to say that like i don't know the research mm-hmm. on that Based on the fact that it is genetic, yeah, I want to say yes. Okay, because I know. Sorry, you're not might, a doctor. No, but. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the research on that. Yeah, but the it it might also just be like how your both your one of your parents has blue eyes, the other has brown yeah. eyes. You might get brown eyes. Okay, you might also get blue eyes mm-hmm. because there might be a recessive gene in the brown eyed parent that causes the blue eyes to come out. Yeah, Jenny, Janet. Genetics is so complicated, yeah. so I don't really know how that works with autism, but it is a genetic okay. thing. Got that it. is a scientific researched fact. Um, so I think the main thing that people need to get in their brains is that autism isn't a death sentence. Mm-hmm. It's not so horrible. Like, a lot of people view autism as oh, the poor little baby who can't talk. Oh, they'll never be able to grow up and have a good life. That's not true. <laughs> there are some some people who are disabled in such a way that their quality of life is impacted by what they have going on. But for a lot of autistic people, for a lot of disabled people, being disabled, being autistic, is not a death sentence. It is not as terrible as it's made out to be i understand maybe not like you know you can grieve that your expectations for your child's life may be different than what they actually end up being but it's not okay to not vaccinate your kids (laughs) because you're afraid that they're going to get autism I don't know exactly how to word it, but if you're afraid of your kid getting autism, it's because you have some internal ableism in you because the autism, yes, impacts me, impacts autistic people in a huge way, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not terrible. It doesn't have to be a terrible thing. It doesn't have to be scary. Mm-hmm. 
you you have resources. It's 2023. There are so many resources, especially for parents of neurodivergent people, of autistic people. Um, there are community groups. You can talk to adult autistic people how they deal with their lives because it's it's not fair to those kids to treat them like there's something so terribly wrong with them yeah. for being autistic. I, even pretending to be neurotypical, was treated terribly for being autistic. So we need to switch our mindsets about what a good life looks like, what mm -hmm. disability looks like, and how it can, it can be okay. It's okay to be disabled. It's okay to be different. Those things are really important to acknowledge and to change our mindsets about because going through life, looking down on disabled people will only impact you negatively because 80% of all people will be disabled eventually. Those 20% of people die before they become disabled. You're gonna need a mobility aid. You're gonna need some cognitive help, perhaps, when you're older. You become disabled when you get older. Or you might become disabled when you're young. Mm -hmm. So looking down on disabled people needs to stop. Yeah. And the acceptance of support, mobility aids, help from friends, help from therapists, it should be normalized and supported. And the way that society looks at disabled people is abhorrent. There should be no reason why disabled people should be looked at in such a negative way. We do not support Autism Speaks. We do not... Explain what that is, because okay. I don't know. So Autism Speaks is a autism... I, I'm just going to be blunt, is an autism hate group. Okay. They disguise themselves as a support group. Uh -huh. They they are like, they want to cure autism. Basically, they believe that autism can be cured. Do they say how? They haven't figured it out. Oh, okay. I mean, they they try a lot of different things, like avoiding vaccinating your kids. Okay. And the like medications, um, training your kids to mask. That's like one of the main things that they they support that you should train your autism out of your kids, uh, which is not how that works. <laughs> it is right. traumatizing. I mean, especially <laughs> too if, I mean, like you said, in a way, fortunately, you were able to have more control to mm -hmm. be aware of when you were going to mask. And uh, even though it was exhausting for you, yeah. you were aware of that. And, like you were yeah, like, I have that privilege. There are some people that don't. That so literally like cannot it, right. control that. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Let's yeah. It, it is It is so frustrating. Yeah. Um, they, they coined the, like, the blue thing, blue for autism awareness, but... They, they they like to use, like, blue lights, blue lighting. Blue lighting is terrible. It is so overstimulating. And why would you pick blue? Because mm. you didn't consult with anyone who's actually autistic. Yeah. <laughs> you just picked a color and, oh, that's now what represents autism. Ask an autistic person. No autistic people enjoy blue lighting unless they don't have a concept of what blue lighting is yeah it's terrible um they also coined the puzzle piece mm -hmm. um which implies that there's something fragmented something missing about autistic people like that there's something that needs to be filled in that space where the puzzle piece mm -hmm. has been left out which is not true autistic people can live totally beautiful fulfilling lives regardless of needs yeah their lives can be fulfilling so you don't need to imply that we're broken mm -hmm. and that we need something to help us right. be fulfilled it doesn't work it so doesn't autism it's speaks is a no no they're a no no okay. we do not support autism speaks they are 
like the worst, mm-hmm. arguably, because they're trying to eradicate autism, okay. which isn't possible mm-hmm. because it's a neurotype. Um, hello, kitty. <laughs> That was the, wow, that was an amazing spring up onto the table. That's that's one thing that helps autistic yeah. people is um, animals. Um, what One of the then. reasons why I noticed that I might be autistic is because of my preference towards animals. Anytime I would go over to like, Oh, an like, event i mean honestly house. same like i always will prefer yes <laughs> animals if there's people. a dog mm-hmm. at the event i will go pet the dog yeah i will talk t- i will introduce myself to right. the dog before i introduce myself to the people at I the party ju- I th- for me i feel like that's like kind of like an anxiety thing like yeah. i feel like it's sub- it's more soothing like if you see an animal somewhere be- it, it almost because it can be even for me and i feel like i'm somebody that like i said i feel like i am really social and i'm good at doing the social thing even if I'm not in the mood but I think Mm -hmm. that being someone that's grown up with anxiety and stuff like that and feeling uncomfortable mainly because of like all my stomach issues and stuff like that but Mm -hmm. um seeing an animal always is something that kind of like eases that stress and easing eases that isn't it so fun it's It's so so cute that like animals can really do that yeah it's because you know that they're pure they're not yes they they have no judgment towards Mm -hmm. you so it's like i i feel like that's what that's part of why autistic people adhd people Mm -hmm. neurodiverse people gravitate towards animals because our the the way that you don't have to put that mask on exactly the way that our experience is is so much more akin to an animal's way of experiencing life very blunt communication Mm -hmm. the you don't you don't have to play the social game like you can communicate with each other without talking yeah all of these reasons why a lot of autistic people feel like they are more like their pets Mm -hmm. than they are like their neurotypical peers yeah because the neurotypical is so foreign right even though they're a person compared to the animal Mm -hmm. being not a person, but so much more personable. Yep. Which is really ironic, but it's just the way that it, that it is. Like if you're, if you always find yourself gravitating towards your pets, if you feel like you yourself may like feel more like your best friends with your pet than you are with your best friend, Mm -hmm. that might be an indication that you have some research to do (laughs) um that yeah there's there's a lot of things for example um that i'm going to spout off a list of things that feel very neurodivergent but are not actually like you can like these things without being neurodivergent just for a disclaimer um dinosaurs trains trains are a big one um dinosaur chicken nuggets specifically (laughs) um mac and cheese mac and cheese is also a big one um space just outer space as a whole concept um clocks numbers time there's so many different things that are just like like these are things that are more like intriguing to you you're saying that if if you have a particular leaning towards like if you were given the option of like a beautiful sirloin steak or dinosaur chicken nuggets, which one would you pick? If you pick the dinosaur chicken nugget, I would pick the dinosaur mm. chicken nuggets. That's, that's, that might indicate something. I mean, mm. there's just a sort of childlike nature okay. of autism that really, if you unmask, comes out and is so much fun to feed into. Um, like I've started buying myself fidget toys and stuffed animals and um, like, you know, squishmallows. Mm-hmm. If you like squishmallows, <laughs> you, you might have some research to do <laughs> um, because those things are just so soothing. Mm-hmm. They're so pleasing to the mind of a neurodivergent. Um, now, of course, none of these are mutually exclusive. You mm-hmm. can like them without being neurodivergent, but there's just something about certain topics certain foods certain things that are very home like for autistic people um and you can find other autistic people or find just an autistic person to talk about Mm -hmm. being autistic with if you search these specific things like if 
you look up Squishmallows on TikTok, you will find a neurodivergent person. I can guarantee it. (laughs) Because those people who have rooms full of Squishmallows are not neurotypical. There's just something about it. I don't think I, I could find a neurotypical person who has an entire room full of Squishmallows unless they're just like a collector. Yeah. But why would you be a collector if you're not neurotypical? Right. <laughs> I got it. So, so. kind of going back to your, your therapist. Mm-hmm. So basically after you kind of listed off things. Yes. How did she decide to diagnose you? Okay. So for the the – before I even got my therapist, mm-hmm. I looked her up on uh, Psychology Today, which is a great website for finding therapists. Uh, she, in her little bio, had listed that she had worked with autism mm-hmm. and ADHD before. And that was really important for me because my my previous therapist, yes, worked with autistic people but wasn't very neuro affirming for people who weren't obvious so excuse me so i sent her an email to be like hey i want to get an autism diagnosis what are your thoughts and she responded very warmly and very neuro affirming and there was no pushback. Mm-hmm. I was really looking for the pushback. If there was any pushback, then I wouldn't have gone for it. Right. Um, because the the first way that you know that a doctor, a therapist, anyone that you're going to isn't going to listen to you is if they don't even believe you right. when you put out that word in the first place. Um, same thing with doctors. If you think you say hey i might have this thing and they say "Mm, i think you just have anxiety Mm -hmm. that's a red flag because they're not gonna believe you their their brain their mind has already shut you out right before the conversation has even started so i wanted to look for an open conversation for something that i could easily go into and get a diagnosis without um worrying about it at that point i wasn't concerned about if I was going to get a diagnosis or not I just wanted some answers if it wasn't autism I wanted to know what it was Mm -hmm. so I explicitly said that I wanted a diagnosis I wanted some assessment done so we went through the process of what that would look like and I took the assessments um I think I want to say there were like eight or so different assessments that I took um some of them were in person some of them were online uh, questionnaire style. Um, the online questionnaires, there was over 300 questions that I answered mm-hmm. about myself. Uh, the in-person, some of them were interviews. Some of them were written things. I um, did a, a little computer test as well, uh, where basically you see letters flashing on the screen. And if it comes up with a specific letter, you're not supposed to press the space bar. For all other letters, press the space bar. That letter, don't press the space bar. That is the ADHD test okay. for impulsivity. Mm-hmm. I did not do very well on the impulsivity yeah. thing. I was just like, there's a letter. Press. Oh. Right. Wasn't supposed to. Exactly. Okay. Um, so you did the tests. So I did the tests uh-huh. and... And then did you meet, you met with her? I did, yes. Okay. I, I meet with my therapist in person. Okay. So we, after she was done doing all the assessments, I had sent um, two different people uh, their perspective of me, yeah. like a questionnaire about me. Mm-hmm. Um, she was done analyzing all of that and we had a sit down conversation yeah. about it. And I was diagnosed with four different things. Okay. Um, Shoot. So <laughs> these impact me all in very different ways yeah. and will definitely change my perspective from other autistic and ADHD mm-hmm. people. So I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, um, ADHD combined type, anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, and other spo- otherwise specified trauma disorder it's there's a longer name than that but it's basically complex ptsd it's not actually in the dsm complex um the dsm is the official diagnostic mm-hmm. book so complex ptsd is the is the sum of what that last one was um 
So basically I experience all of what PTSD is, except I've never experienced a, what they call a criterion A event, which could, uh, which is a, a more intense experience, like going to war, right, seeing okay. someone die, stuff like that. So you experience um, the symptoms, but haven't really had. I've never event. had something okay. that has been as intense as okay. those things that Got are it. specifically for criterion A. I have experienced, um, much like sm like quote unquote smaller things yeah, just like over you, a long right, period of yeah. time and i think in general like everybody experiences different sort of traumas yeah, that can I was, affect people in very different exactly ways i was talking too. with my therapist about this and what the conclusion even she has is that because i have never experienced something to that degree uh -huh my experience is subjective to my own life. Mm -hmm. So just because I haven't seen someone die in front of me doesn't mean that I don't experience the symptoms of PTSD, of yeah. post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, now, this does not at all discount those people who do have PTSD, who have experienced those Criterion A experiences. Their experiences are different from mine. Mm -hmm. But... Within my subjective life of the things that I've experienced, my the way that my brain and my body have reacted is very similar, yeah. if not identical, to a lot of the people who have experienced those things. So they're not allowed to call it PTSD. So it's not PTSD. Okay. <laughs> it's just a really saying. long name. Yeah, got it. Um, so the me having anxiety causes the way that masking and other things gives me a little bit more of a heightened sense of anxiety within myself. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't have anxiety disorder, um, my level of anxiety naturally would probably be higher than the average person because of being autistic. Okay. You just experience anxiety as an autistic person. Um, but for myself, it is heightened from my from my standard level right. so that's why i was diagnosed with that <clears throat> um so that those those four diagnoses i at first i celebrated i was so happy that i was right mm -hmm. <laughs> that i had almost like deduced it in my in myself um and i left the therapist and then i felt so sad yeah because being autistic is really hard. Anyone who's seen an autistic person knows, like everyone, anyone who knows an autistic person knows that that autistic person's life is really hard from the way that they experience things. Um, it's interesting too, because I think it kind of gives a different perspective of like how hard it is. Not even, I guess, to like, like not, people might not see it on the outside, but yeah. how hard it is for for you within like mentally That's, that like, is the whole reason why it went un, unnoticed right. for so long because autism adhd doesn't is show. all inside yeah. it's so subjective to the person's experience right. the internal workings of the mind yeah and like there could be things here and there that come out that could exactly. like be a red flag or make you be like oh well oh something's that might different be. right but like but overall, from an outside right exactly be because i was able to hide it so well because i had been trained so yeah like in such a perfect way right to pretend to and fit that's in that's why two people will label it as like you being weird or that or different even most of the time if you go to a psychologist psychiatrist they will say oh you have borderline personality disorder or you have ocd they just throw these labels on you instead of actually looking into what your experience is like yeah because there are a lot of therapists historically have just been afraid of diagnosing mm -hmm. autism because it doesn't look like autism right it just looks like you're a very emotional person or you're really obsessed with numbers so ocd you have these weird obsessions with people bpd it's it's just a cop-out yeah. <laughs> but what what is going on is so much more personal so much more in depth and there are names for things like echolalia, for example, uh, audio processing disorder, um, sensory issues, having intense special interests, uh, perseveration. 
these are all words that very aptly describe a lot of processes that go on in the mind. But if you have no idea what these words mean, then how can you possibly tell your provider what's going yeah. on with you? That's that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to talk about your symptoms, to mm -hmm. talk about what you're experiencing, to have a label to put on those words so you can exchange the information with other yeah. people. Because if you can't, if you don't have the language to reach out for help, you can't reach out for help. And I think too, to even understand your triggers in a way, like yes. things that do affect you and bother you so that you can not put yourself in situations that might be harder for you yeah. to so, deal with. That's one of the things that has changed my life. Okay. Getting a diagnosis has – naturally, I had been suspicious that I was autistic before I got my diagnosis, but having it confirmed and, like, gaining so much more access to resources has – changed my perspective on myself on the world on how i have to exist in society and even to educate like you're doing now because exactly. i feel like it's so important right and because there's so like you said there's probably so many people that might not even know what's going on and might have some idea like oh like something might be different but what you know and it, it's sad too because seeking out help through therapists might not even give you those answers right away exactly. if they don't even if they're not really educated which is enough. why i am a firm supporter of self-diagnosis mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who say that self-diagnosis is like oh you're just making things up you should really go to a doctor well sometimes doctors aren't accessible to no people. i agree yeah and i think doing your own research is just as important as getting a professional opinion exactly and, and honestly, multiple opinions too the diagnosis doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. The For some things, it does in the sense of insurance. You can get a diagnosis to get prescriptions for things. But if you're able to apply coping mechanisms for something, for autism, without a diagnosis and it works, that's all that matters. Yeah. That's all that's really important mm -hmm. is, is what's going to help you helping is is what you're trying helping that's that's really the important part because you can for example i am suspicious that i i am suspecting that i have uh what's called ehlers danlos syndrome which is very common comorbidity in neurodivergent populations which is the fancy way to say i have uh tissue connectivity problems so all of my joints hurt all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> um and I have partial or full dislocations of a lot of my joints as well, which can be very painful. Um, for some people, this is entirely like they can't go places without right. mobility aids. It's very disabling. For me, I am privileged enough that it hasn't gotten that bad yet, yet, mm -hmm. uh, which is the important part. Um, but because... Because I'm able to quantify my experience with words, I can go to the doctor yeah. next week when I have my appointment and tell them about the fact that I'm having subluxations or partial, partial dislocations of mm -hmm. my joints. Um, it is very uncomfortable when I'm walking and my toe dislocates in my shoe and I can't do anything about it. <laughs> um, same thing with like mental health problems if you have words for it it's really helpful beneficial yeah. it can change your life to um get a diagnosis or like i've been doing i have been buying supportive clothing so for example i have knee braces i have ankle braces i have wrist braces that i use to help prevent pain mm -hmm. before it happens like if I wake up and I'm feeling like my kneecap is going to shift out of place sometime during the day, I can pull on one of my knee sleeves and not be in pain all day anymore. Um, so I haven't gotten that diagnosis yet, but because I have a name for what's going on and I've looked up ways to solve it and I've tried applying methods of mm -hmm. dealing with the symptoms and it works for me, that's all that matters. Yeah. Now, the diagnosis would be very helpful, again, for insurance purposes and um, just to make sure that that's actually what's going on and it's not something much worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, if 
if fidget toys help you with your sanity, buy some fidget toys. Mm -hmm. It's really okay. Universal design is um, something that helps all of us. Yeah. So, for example, doorknobs that have the the L L shaped doorknob instead of the twist doorknob mm -hmm. help everyone. You don't have to have that twisting ability in your wrist. You can use your your fist to mm -hmm. push the door open, like to push down on the knob and get the door open. You can use your elbow. If you're holding something, you can get it open without having to use your hand and twist. Same thing, fidget toys. If they help calm you, if you feel like they're improving your life, then that should be accepted. That should be something that we all choose to do more readily in our lives. Have you become a part of any like support groups for autism or anything like that or... Um, I have yet to seek out support groups. Mm -hmm. I personally, all of my friends are autistic and or ADHD. Mm -hmm. So I have built my own little support community. community yeah. Because. Which is important because everybody deserves to feel understood. Everybody. Yeah. That's one of those things that's super, super important. Talking about your experiences with other people who yeah. share your experiences is really validating. You can find resources from them. Mm -hmm. um, like if you're, say for example, you're 15 and you're like, I don't know what's going on with me. You can talk to somebody who's like me, who's 22, right. who's experienced life as an autistic person and is now figuring out all of these cool ways yeah. to deal with things and all of these resources that you can look up and you can take online assessments. They're mm -hmm. not always the best, but you can do the self-assessment checklists those right. are really awesome for being able to have an inkling of if you know what these words are mm -hmm. this might be what you're experiencing right and i've taken checklists for a lot of different things i've taken self-assessments for a lot of different things anxiety depression autism adhd ocd uh even like i've gone into research on tourette's and all kinds of other things, even though I don't necessarily have all of those things, right. it checks off certain boxes and gets rid of things that I don't need to think about. Yeah. Like OCD. I don't have OCD. I've never experienced that. So I was able to say, these are all of the words that describe how OCD feels like in your body, and I don't experience that. So I don't have to worry about mm -hmm. dealing with that. Um, same thing. If you resonate with me you can look up an autism checklist i think where is i have a name there is a name for a checklist that i have let's see where it is samantha craft unofficial autism checklist so this is one of the checklists um that i found after my diagnosis but i resonate with a lot of the checklist mm -hmm. um so I definitely recommend the Samantha Craft Autism un Unofficial Checklist. And if you resonate with it, you might seek a diagnosis or you yeah. might seek resources for yourself, even if you don't want a diagnosis or can't access a diagnosis. Um, just acceptance that something might be different mm -hmm. even is important. Like yeah. it's okay to be different. It's okay to choose yourself. Right. You choose your healing journey by researching ways, by finding resources, by talking to people. Um, and if you don't have autism, that's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to have autism. <laughs> if you don't have autism, that might be better for you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what your experience is like. You don't know what my experience is like. So just be curious mm -hmm. and open, you know, to the idea that doing something for yourself might help you or help someone else because yeah. even if you take the checklist and say eh, i'm not really autistic you can tell someone else who's curious about it right someone one of your friends one of your family members who starts talking about it it's like i've been thinking about that my i might be a little bit different 
oh, how are you? How are you? How are you thinking about? What do you mean? Why? Why do you feel like you're different? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just feel like I don't really understand social cues very well, and I don't really get sarcasm, and I feel like the lights are too loud. <laughs> right. Oh, oh, I have something for you. You know, you mm-hmm. can help people without being part of the community you can be involved you can be an ally in that way and I think too like I said I I really like how you went about the episode because I feel like you could like there's so many different ways to carry each episode and I always tell my guests like do your thing however you want to approach it and feel comfortable doing that but I really like that you shared your experience but Mm -hmm. also it was very educational for me and then I'm sure so many people watching and listening so I appreciate that I really do think that there's probably going to be at least one per- person that watches that might not have a diagnosis or might mm-hmm. not even might not have even thought twice and might be like wow like I really resonate with some of these things that she said which I mm-hmm. feel like is always the most important thing because I think like I said it's so important for people to feel heard and to feel like they can relate to people yes so that's why I love to have so many different types of people on because I feel like there's always someone that someone can relate to yeah which is important i just think it's so important to talk about it yeah to, to be es- open and everything. especially in medical mental mm-hmm. health all of those things are just talking about it because yeah. if you if you don't talk about it you'll never know i agree if you don't think about it if you don't look into yourself you'll never you'll never know you'll or never understand because exactly. a lot of people don't understand like i feel like even you know some people might Some people might know that there's different levels and needs of autism. Some people Mm -hmm. might not. Some people might generalize it as nothing. Some people might generalize it as like being completely disabled. Like who knows what people think. So I think that I I always say education is key because understanding is the first step, I think, in making people more more accepting of Mm -hmm. everyone, which is important. Yeah. Because we live in a very evil world. We do. Yeah. And having the language to have community Mm -hmm. is so, so important. Yeah. And it's it's not just for people in the community. It's also for people outside of the community. Mm -hmm. Like you might not experience autism, but you can be involved. You can support your friends who are autistic. Right. You can learn how their brains work Mm -hmm. because – well, we spend our entire lives learning how neurotypical brains work. So it might be nice for you to spend some time learning about how your autistic friend's brain works. And it can, it might even help you. You might Mm -hmm. discover that something helps you, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you did amazing. And thank thank you you so much for coming on and educating and and teaching us all something. It was great. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Of course, of course.
Enjoy today's episode. 